Okay, thank you. And thank you all for having us today. Um, you should about pulling up the, the presentation. So we are um, delighted to speak with you today about um, common myths about aging. My name is Jessica Harper and I am the um, branch chief of our health communications branch at the National Institute on Aging. And Yusha Bell is my colleague, um, and she is a writer editor on our team. And this is um, particularly a delight for Yusha Bell and I to, to come present today. We are often the ones uh, behind the scenes um, working on developing our, our um, health information content and some of the materials that we'll be talking about today. And are you, is the presentation working okay, Yushabel? Um, what, what are you seeing? Are you seeing just the myths about aging screen or are you seeing the, um, the PowerPoint screen? I just see the myths about aging screen like it's in, it's in the presentation mode. Okay. Um, but, I mean, this is good on my end. Yeah, it looks good. Looks good to go. I'm having issues on this end because when I go to the next screen, it won't. Go okay, okay. I'm just gotta change it to that way. Oops, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Yeah, so you can. Is it okay on your end? You can see your um, notes. Yes, it just it okay. was changing right, but I'm gonna share it again. I'm gonna fix it and then share it again. So sorry, guys. Okay, great. And then one, can you go one forward? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. So, so I, um, before we dive into the myths, I wanted to talk a little bit about what, um, what the National Institute on Aging is, who we are, um, and, and what we do. And so uh, the National Institute on Aging, or, or NIA, is one of 27 institutes and centers of the National Institutes of Health. Um, NIH more broadly as a government agency that conducts and supports research to enhance health, lengthen life, and reduce illness and disability. Um, some of the other agencies within NIH that you might have heard of are the National Cancer Institute, the National Institute of Mental Health, and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and that one in particular might be familiar um, because that is where Dr. Anthony Fauci is the director of that institute. Um, our group, NIA, was established in 1974 to improve the health and well-being of older adults through research. So that's you know, particularly our, our focus. Um, NIA does also take a lifespan approach to looking at how to improve the health, of, um, health and well-being of older adults, considering that, that things that happen earlier in our life can affect um, us later in our lives. Um, and next slide, please. So just to talk about NIA's mission, um, so we, as I said, we support and conduct research on aging and diseases and conditions of, associated with growing older, such as, um, such as dementia or um, um, you know, other conditions. We foster the development of, of scientists and researchers and provide um, infrastructure for researchers in this area to do their work. Um, and we disseminate information um, to the public, healthcare professionals, and the scientific community. And this last part is really um, where the work that uh, Yushabel and I lives. We, um, we help translate the scientific information and findings into communication products that, that help people learn about these diseases and conditions um, and healthy aging in general and, and what they can do. Um, next slide, please. So this is the, the, the work that Yushval and I do with our health information. We have over 200 articles online covering topics related to healthy aging, age-related diseases and conditions. We have a series of print and PDF publications that people can download or order for free. Um, we also have an information call center um, where people can call in and ask questions um, and again, request those publications. Uh, we produce some, some feature articles that go um, take a deeper dive into some of the areas that, that NIA is investing, you know, some of the promising research findings on the horizon. 
And we help produce other communication products such as videos and infographics um, and other materials to reach, reach um, particular audiences. And so, you know, one of our one of our popular publications is our article on the 10 myths about aging. And so that's what we wanted to talk with you about today. Um, we have many other publications that delve into the different topics and areas that you Chevelle is going to talk about today. Um, so it, we would be happy to share these slides with with you all um, and also to follow up with any additional materials that we could provide based on questions that you might have later. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Shabal. Hi. So there are a lot of misconceptions about what happens as we age. One misconception is that depression and loneliness are a normal part of aging. Although depression is a common mood disorder, it is not a normal part of aging. In fact, growing older can have many emotional benefits such as long lasting relationships with friends and family and a lifetime of memories to share with loved ones. Some studies show that older adults are less likely to experience depression than young adults. But it's important to remember that older adults with depression may have less obvious symptoms or be less likely to discuss their feelings. Talk with your doctor if you begin showing signs of depression, such as irritability or decreased energy. Some people believe that the older I get, the less sleep I need. But in actuality, older adults still need seven to nine hours of sleep each night. It may be harder falling and staying asleep as we age, but it's not true that a person's sleep needs declines with age. The benefits to getting a good night's rest are many, like reducing your risk of falls, improving your overall mental well-being, helping to reduce your risk for certain health conditions. So what can you do to get a better night's sleep? Here are some tips from our infographic. You can go to bed and wake up at the same time every day, even on weekends. Find ways to relax before bedtime each night. Avoid distraction such as cell phones, computers, and televisions in your bedroom. Exercise at regular times each day, but not within three hours of your bedtime. Don't eat large meals or drink caffeine or alcohol late in the day. Avoid long naps. That's generally over 30 minutes in the late afternoon or evening. When it comes to learning, it is assumed that older adults can't learn new things. However, older adults can still learn new things, create new memories, and improve their performance on a variety of skills. Aging does not come with changes in thinking, but many changes are positive, such as having more wisdom and insight from a lifetime of experiences. And trying and learning new things may even improve your thinking and memory. For example, one study found that older adults who learned quilting or digital photography had improved memory. Another misconception is that it is inevitable that older people will get dementia. That's not true. The risk of developing dementia increases as you age, but many people never develop any form of dementia. As we age, it is normal to experience mild forgetfulness, such as forgetting what day it is or which word to use, or losing things from time to time. In contrast, if someone is losing track of the date or time of year, or is misplacing things often and having trouble finding them, that may be a sign of a more serious memory problem. If you have concerns with any changes in your memory and thinking, talk with your doctor. One form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. Many people believe if a family member has Alzheimer's disease, they will have it too. However, a family history of Alzheimer's does not mean for sure that you will develop it. A family history of dementia may increase a person's risk, but there are many factors that may affect a person's risk for Alzheimer's, including genes and family history, environmental and lifestyle factors such as exercise, diet, exposure to pollutants and smoking. We don't yet know for certain what may prevent Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia, 
But in general, leading a healthy lifestyle may help address risk factors that have been associated with these diseases. For example, controlling high blood pressure, maintaining a healthy weight, and staying physically and mentally active. <clears throat> As you get older, many people think older adults should take it easy and avoid exercise so they don't get injured. <clears throat> But the truth is, older adults have a lot to gain by being active and a lot to lose by sitting too much. Exercise and physical activity have shown to help maintain independence as you age, improve balance and stability, improve mental and physical health. Almost anyone at any age with most health conditions can participate in some type of physical activity. According to the physical activity guidelines for Americans, you should do at least 150 minutes, that's about two and a half hours a week of moderate to intensity aerobic exercises like brisk walking or fast dancing. Being active at least three days a week is best, but doing anything is better than doing nothing at all. You should also do muscle strengthening activities like lifting weights or doing sit-ups at least twice a day, well, twice a week. The physical activity guidelines also recommend that as part of your weekly physical activity, you should combine multiple components of exercising. For example, try balance training as well as aerobic and muscle strengthening activities. A similar misconception is now that I am older, I will have to give up driving. Nope, there is not a certain age when you need to stop driving. What matters is your ability to drive safely. Things to consider. Do cars or people walking seem to appear out of nowhere? Do I have trouble staying in my lane? Do I have trouble moving my foot between the gas and the brake pedals or do I sometimes confuse the two? Have family and friends or my doctor said they're worried about my driving? Those are some of the things you can ask yourself to determine whether or not it is time for you to stop driving. Osteoporosis is a condition in which bones become weak and brittle. Many believe only women need to worry about osteoporosis, but no matter your gender, you can still be affected by osteoporosis. Men may not be as likely to have osteoporosis, but they can still be affected and underdiagnosed because of this belief. One in five men over the age of 50 will have an osteoporosis related fracture. By age 65 or 70, men and women lose bone mass at the same rate. There is no age limit to change your health for the better. Some believe I'm too old to quit smoking. Truth is quitting smoking at any time improves your health. Quitting smoking can improve your blood circulation, improve your sense of taste and smell, increase your ability to exercise, lower your risk of cancer, heart attack, stroke, and lung disease. The last misconception is when health starts to improve, you can stop taking your medication. For example, my blood pressure has lowered or returned to normal, so I can stop taking my medication. Nope, that just means that the medicine and lifestyle changes you have made are working. It's important to continue your treatment and activities long-term. If you stop taking your medicine, your blood pressure could rise again. Always talk with your doctor first before making any changes to your medicines or other treatments. To learn more about myths of aging and other health information for older adults, please visit our website at www.nia.nih.gov health. We also offer print publications and PDFs to download at order.nia.nih.gov. To speak to an information specialist, call 800-222-2225 or email niaic at nia.nih.gov. We will also be sharing this presentation with you 
with all the links to our infographics that were featured within them. Are there any questions or comments? I wonder if you might discuss, dementia seems to be a very big issue for many of us. And from what I've read, the whole research approach has changed. Could you, do you have any information on what the new studies are on treatment of dementia as well as prevention? Sure, I can speak to this one. Um, the, so NIA has, um, NIA and other agencies within, I, within NIH have significantly increased the research that they're doing in this area. And as you said, you know, historically, um, the, the years ago, the, the sort of research was really focused more um, on a couple of different targets. And now it's expanded um, much further beyond that. So initially, the targets were focusing more on the certain, certain pathologies or um, things that were happening in the brain. And now the research is focused on still on that. And there are some, um, some potential medications that are, are in, in um, mid to late stage clinical trials that are testing their, their efficacy and um, you know, the potential approval. Um, but there's also a very broad portfolio of research in terms of um, some of the things that you should mentioned with lifestyle factors, you know, looking at at exercise and diet, um, uh, a lot of um, also a look at how sort of treating treating and helping people living with dementia and their family members. So you know, also looking into some of the different caregiver caregiving programs, um, the the different ways that we can help address behaviors, behavioral interventions for changes that people experience when they have Alzheimer's or related dementia. Um, and, and then different in, in the, in the medication, um, arena, there's also, uh, a broadening of different targets and different, um, research going into ways to diagnose, be able to diagnose, you know, the, the conditions earlier and potentially even, even, um, uh, identify people who might be at risk before they're, they're, uh, showing symptoms, um, and, and, and then being able to, um, treat in the sort of varieties, variety of ways that I talked about. I think that the current, this is the information that we have on our website is that there likely wouldn't, won't be one, one treatment for Alzheimer's disease or related dementias, but a combination of these different things that might include a medication and behavioral and lifestyle changes, much like we, we have with, um, with heart health, high blood pressure and with cancer. Um, someone asked in the chat if uh, the seven to nine hours of sleep have to be one of it or can that supplement. Um, the seven to nine hours of sleep should be in one event at nighttime, just so you can fully go through your REM cycle. Um, and then with taking naps, that could be throughout the day. But as stated, you should try not to go over 30 minutes because the longer your naps are, the more likely you will go into your REM sleep cycle and once you're in your REM cycle if you interrupt it you'll make, wake up more groggy or not have as much energy so yeah so for the seven to nine hours um do that at night just straight through and you should wake up fine and also just know your body you kind of know if you need like seven hours of sleep a night or if you need nine hours you can kind of determine when your REM cycle starts to like slow down and it's over and you could keep a sleep journal so that way you can write how you feel the time of sleep you go if you go to sleep later what time you wake up does that mess up the rest of your day is your energy low or something um but yes um they mentioned that there's been recent news about sleeping in two shifts yeah, I'm not familiar with that. It's um, I I think that's such a great question though, and I am curious about um, uh, sort of information about what you know, napping and length of lengths of naps and that kind of thing. So I think that was, yeah, something that we could definitely look into.
Did anyone else have any questions? You know, it, it, I'm sorry, I'm, I always have lots of questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we're starting to at least, uh, I'm aware of many people, a number of people I know have Parkinson's disease and there is dementia associated with that as well. Do you have any materials or guidance? And uh, I know there are, for a lot of these issues, we're talking about heart health, dementia, Parkinson's, that there are separate organizations, nonprofits devoted to that as well. Could you talk a little bit about how you work with them or is any of that coordinated with all of these areas, but particularly Parkinson's? Sure, sure, I can speak to that one too. That um, we do have information on um, in our publications, both about Parkinson's disease and about Parkinson's disease dementia um, and the connection to Lewy body dementia and um, how someone could have Lewy body dementia with Parkinsonism, um, the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And so there's, it is, um, there's definitely a connection there and it's something that, that we provide information on. We work with, we do work with the different organizations um, and particularly on, on, on being aware of the different information that they're providing, you know, how we, um, what, how, how we can add um, value in the information that we're providing and also to make sure that, um, to understand, you know, how, and particularly the, the advocacy organizations or the different support group organizations are, um, have a lot of communication with the different communities that they provide support for. And so they help us understand what the different needs are and the kind of language and messaging that we can use um, that aligns with what, with what other groups are doing. Thank you very much. I want to thank you both for taking the time to chat with us today. I very much enjoyed it and learned a lot. I think it's important to dispel some of those uh, sort of very pervasive myths. Um, does anyone else have any last questions? Oh, before you wrap up, feel free to put them in the chat or just unmute yourself. We do have plenty of extra time here. Uh, Betsy asks, how do you know if you are in REM sleep? Um, REM sleep, you get into your REM sleep after a couple of hours of sleeping. Um, you'll know you're in your REM sleep if you start to dream, um, because that can only occur if you're fully asleep. And basically when you're in REM, that's when your mind is finally at rest and cautiously you're not like awake or alert. So you kind of, you won't really know you're in REM because you'll be on sleeping and unconscious, but you know you're over your REM if you can easily wake up or when you're starting to go to sleep, you can still be like moving around. But when you're in your REM, that's when you're in deep sleep. REM doesn't really last that long. Um, like it does last long within the sleep, but it might not feel that long because um, it's just you're falling asleep, then in the middle, you're in your REM, and then you can start to wake up and then that's when you know your REM is over. I hope that helped answer. Thank you, I see in the chat um, that, that someone shared the article. Thank you for sharing that article about the segmented sleep. Um, I'm, I'm curious if, if, I could, if I could ask a question actually from the group, if, if there are, if there's information that you you really feel like you would like to see in what we're producing um, or you know things that could be helpful to you in our materials. Uh, one of the things that I'm always curious about is what is cutting edge in research? Where would we go to find out the what's the most recent discovery in some area? Do you have a particular areas of interest or is that just um, sort of in general with healthy aging and, and 
like we're talking I, about. Yeah, yeah I, I think in general, because uh, there's so much, you know, we get the uh, the Tuesday science section, usually in New York Times and Post, and there's always uh, something interesting there. And, you know, you know, knowing where else to go to get more information. And then, you know, there's also uh, the clinical trials, I imagine. Uh, and the other thing that I know, I don't know if other people on this uh, Zoom have had this experience, are being approached by researchers to participate in studies. And what would be the pros and cons of that? That's great to know. Thank you for sharing those things. That, um, yeah, the, the what is cutting edge of research? That's really helpful to know. I think, um, you know, we do provide some information on, on that in terms of like summarizing studies, but I think it's interesting to think about different ways that we might be able to um, kind, of, kind of present that information. Um, and we do have some, some information on pros and cons of, of participating in clinical trials that, that we can share. Um, another person asked in the chat, they said, I dream just before I wake up. Yes, when you, sometimes though, people will wake up and not remember they were dreaming, but when you're in your REM, your, um, your brain activity starts to increase. So usually it's subconsciously whatever visuals is in your head or what are you thinking that produces into a visual dream-like quality. Um, and that's when you're deep into your REM because if you like sometimes dream and you try to wake up in the middle of the dream, you really can't, you're stuck in your dream and that's because you're going through your REM. When the dream starts to fade or it starts to like dwindle down, that's when your REM is starting to um, go away and your um, and then shortly after you do end up waking up. And if you try to, that's why some people do keep a dream journal and they quickly write their dreams when they wake up. But the likelihood of you knowing everything you just dreamt about um, is not likely because for a majority of that time you were in your REM, so you're not gonna remember it. So yes, you do kind of dream right before you wake up, but you might not remember that you were dreaming. Any any further questions? Um, well, I <laughs> it's me again. Any anyone else? Uh, uh, I just do want to make sure that everyone else has a chance to talk sure. as well. If anyone uh, does anyone else have any questions? Uh, it doesn't seem like it though. So if you have one last question, Lorna, I can okay. I think we can definitely go with uh, that. In all the the myths that you were talking about, is there one or maybe two that are more important than another? in staying healthy? Is there a hierarchy? Um, I would generally say all the myths are important, but um, I think what is really important is to know that it doesn't matter what age you are, you can always better your health. I think a lot of people, as they start to get older, they start to give up and they think, well, this is how my body is, or this is how my health is, it's gonna stay like this forever. I'm, I'm too much older that it doesn't even matter no more, but that's actually very false. It doesn't matter what age you are. You can always, um, you can always work your health to become better. You can always start eating healthy or start working out and it doesn't even have to be drastic, but any change you do to help better your health will still take effect even at whatever age you are. If you start young or if you start older, there will always be, be benefits of um, changing your lifestyle to be a healthier lifestyle. Yeah, and I would say if I could just jump on to that one, I think that this, this you should all touched on, I think the physical activity is certainly um, is very important. The um, healthy eating, which I, I don't think we had of a myth about that, but that's something that um, is, is a high priority. And, and then managing um, the different, you know, in, in this, instance, we talk about high blood pressure, managing high blood pressure, and I think in general, more broadly, of course, just managing um, the different conditions that one might have and sort of staying, staying on top of those um, recommendations from the doctor um, are really good as well. 
Um, another question that was asked is, um, what is the prevalence of dementia among older people since we say many, but not most older people will get dementia? Yeah, I would have to look at the, um, I'd have to look at the data on that. It does um, increase with age. And so as, um, as people are into their 80s and 90s, um, there's a higher prevalence of dementia um, than, than people in their 60s and 70s. Um, but I could definitely look, look that up and share that, share that um, with Jonas or Lorna to pass along. Um, we do have uh, some, some recent findings that touch on that. And um, another common mention um, would help to elaborate on each myth. So, on when we share the PowerPoint with you guys, a lot of our myths do have um, an infographic that goes along with it. On the infographic, it will give you more information as well as um, we have an article dedicated to myths about aging. And within the article, there will be links to our other articles that will talk about certain areas. So for example, dementia in that section of the article that talks about dementia, or Alzheimer's, it will link it link you to another article that talks more about Alzheimer's or different types of dementias. And then we have an infographic that talks about four different types of dementias. So um, yes. Um, they said it would be helpful to hear us talk about the information we'll be sending. Yeah, thank you for that feedback. That's really helpful for us to know. I think we can definitely keep that in mind for um, if we do this presentation in the future, we could definitely expand more on the different points. Great, and I'll make sure the infographic gets shared out afterwards. Thank you.